You're in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, please. The Apostle Paul says something pretty powerful. Chapter 5, book of Galatians. Would you look at verse 16, please? I say then, walk in the Spirit. Really, be filled with the Spirit. Remember the second chapter of the book of Acts? Yeah, like that. Be filled with the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and then you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Twelve-step programs are important. They have their place. Behavioral modification is a real thing. But truly, instead of shifting my, I'm not going to sin to something else, God says, be filled with the Spirit. How do you do that? We say it around here, word every day, worship every day, prayer every day, and fellowship. WWPF. We've said it this way. We've threatened a bumper sticker. Open up a can of whoop. <laughs> WWPF. Word every day, worship every day. Those songs, even if it's Jesus loves me, this I know. Word every day, worship every day, um, prayer every day, all the time, and then, of course, fellowship, like what we're doing here. The Bible says the more you plug, the more we plug our head into that, we're filled with the Spirit. And God promises that you, that I, will be so filled with the Spirit that we lose our appetites for the things that are just, you know, they're destroying me. Behavioral modification has its place but it doesn't sort of dull the urge or the hunger for my sin. Being filled with the Spirit crowds out of those other unctions and hungers. It's a powerful thing. Uh, skip down to verse number 19. Now, if you're not filled, if I'm not filled with the Spirit, here's what my life is going to look like. Now, the works of the flesh are evident in these. Adultery, fornication. So there would be your sexual sins uncleanness, what's playing in the theater of your mind. You let that play long enough, and then you're going to act upon those things, and that's what lewdness is. You're doing those things. Idolatry. Ah, I don't have a, a statue of Buddha in my house, but that's not really what idolatry is. Idolatry is making up your own God. And the Laodicean church of these last days, in my opinion, is full of that. Making up the Jesus that agrees with my thing, my, my bitterness. I get to do this and I get to say that. Why? Well, because that's what Jesus does. Well, you get the wrong Jesus. That is an idol. And when I want to fashion a God or Jesus into my own image, I have created an idol. And then God's word says ABC, but my idol says, no, 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 you do what I say. That's idolatry. It's the work of the flesh. Sorcery. That's the Greek word pharmakia. That's where we're going to get our word pharmaceuticals, drug use. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition. God is all about, and Jesus modeled, Father, not my will, but yours be done. When I wrench the steering wheel from the Lord, then I'm doing the driving, and I am selfish ambition. It's a work of the flesh. Dissensions. There's friction wherever I go, and in every setting and situation. And then ultimately heresies. That's where your false doctrine is going to come from. There's more. There's envy. What's that? You want more <laughs> of something that God says, I've already given you plenty of. There's murders. Why well, don't kill anybody? Yeah, but do you rash and rage, and rage against somebody? Jesus says, if you can't forgive somebody in your heart, it's the same as what? Murder. I've murdered the character on social media or to somebody else at the water cooler. Drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, those who practice those things. Now, all of us can fall into these sins, to be sure. But does it bother you when you're there? If you can do those things without even thinking about them, the Bible says you're probably not born again. True story. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, verse 22. But when the Spirit is doing the driving, when you are filled with the Spirit, look at verse 22. 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Some of your translations then say patience, but no, the real word is long what? Long what? Yeah, I don't like that part, but there it is. And while I am suffering long, I am what? Kind. That's the flow. Not, I'm so long suffering right now. <laughs> I'm long suffering and I have a supernatural supply of kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. My yes is yes, my no is no, I do what I say. Verse 23 gentleness. And what's that last one? Self-control. When the Holy Spirit is doing the driving, when you're filled with the Spirit, let me sort of illustrate it this way. Uh, now, if you would please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Gospel of John, chapter 14. Let me sort of explain it this way. If you've ever wrestled the addictive cycle, it's no picnic it really isn't. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm so not going to do it. I don't want to do it. And that's all you can think about. <laughs> and then finally, you can't help it. I do it. Woo. And for a couple seconds, wee. And then kerklunk. You hit the bottom. Oh, I've done it again. And I don't have the joy. I don't have the love. don't have the peace. don't have the patience. And then I start feeling really bad about that. And then here comes that old voice again. Yeah, but you want to do it again, don't you? No, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. Wee! Kerklunk. Oh, wee! Kerklunk. And over and over it goes. It's tiresome, and it'll suck the life out of your marriage, out of your life. God says, I know about that cycle. I know it's important. The humans try to enter Jacked or interpose something that gets your mind maybe is steered in another direction, and I get that. Here's what Paul is saying. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hopefully, your experience here on a Sunday, perhaps a Wednesday or a Tuesday, you just feel the sense of the Lord so strongly. If your peddler or your dealer, I don't know why he's got a trench coat on in my mind, but he was right outside the door, and he's all, hey, psh. I got your stuff. Hopefully, if he was doing that on a Sunday morning right after church, you'd be, I have no appetite for that. No, thank you. And you walk right on past. It's kind of a clumsy way of explaining. When we are filled with the Spirit, God changes your heart and your appetites. That said, I want to show you the, uh, we're going to get down to chapter we're in chapter 14, we'll only get to about verse, chapter 14, and we're only going to get to about verse 14. But I wanted to show you Galatians 5, because it's really important. Jesus is going to talk about, and talk to, I should say, what I believe is one of the most powerful of human emotions. It's the most effective gut punch of the enemy. Disappointment and discouragement. It can be so debilitating, we can lose all strength. And you want to just give up, and you want to lay down and stay on the mat. I don't know if that's anybody else in this room, but I've sure been there a time or two. Do you remember, or perhaps you're going through something right now, so disappointed. Something didn't happen as I thought, and now I think, God, what are you doing? Proverbs 13, verse 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And the devil knows that. So he sees to it that all people will encounter disappointment, and especially disappointment with God himself. We're going to talk about that here this morning. I believe that disappointment with God takes out more Christians and sinks more marriages and ministries than any other of the enemy's diabolical strategies. I really believe that. Well, what's a discouragement? What's a disappointment? Man, I thought it was going to turn out like this. And it didn't. Today we're going to encounter, Jesus has just said to the disciples, one of you, of the 12, is going to betray me. What? Peter, you're the strongest, but you're going to deny me three times before sunrise. What? 
and I'm going away, and none of you can follow me. Talk about a downer. Wow. When my truth is not God's actual truth, and something doesn't turn out like I wanted, there comes disappointment, even anger. There, says the enemy, and then he whispers his classics. If God is so hungry for relationship, why does he seem so distant? Mm -hmm. And you're all, yeah. If God cares for us, then why does he let bad things happen? Mm -hmm. Right. And if God's promises are so true, how come you're not seeing hardly any of them happen? Mm -hmm. And you're all, Yes! <laughs> if you would, Chris, go ahead and put this book up. As a new believer, somebody recommended this book to me, and it really was one of the most important books I ever read. As a new believer, I read this. Philip Yancey's Disappointment with God. Do you love the gate there? That's the gate to heavenly presence, so to speak, and God's all, close, get out of here, scram. You ever felt like that? It was huge for my spiritual growth. And it's subtitled, Three Questions That No One Asks Out Loud. Go ahead, Chris. Is God unfair? Is God silent? And is God hidden? You ever had those? We're going to see this morning, and I'll give you the punchline to Mr. Yancey's excellent book. And it really is Isaiah 55, verse 9. Isaiah 55, verse 9, God says to Isaiah, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, Isaiah, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. By the way, how far does the atmosphere go out? Uh, I don't know. Um, Fred would probably tell us about 80,000 feet. I don't know thereabouts. It's where the last of the atmosphere is. All right, let's call it that. How high are the heavens above us humans? God says, I know things you don't know. I know the future you don't. The bottom line of why we are most often disappointed with God is because we thought God was going to behave, well, like I would. Also, this is also important. Next to Isaiah 55, verse 9, would you write? Jeremiah 29 Verse 11, <laughs> this has been a rough old season here at Harvest for many. I bet some of you have this on your refrigerator. Somebody once told me, put it on your refrigerator or in your Bible, whichever you open most. <laughs> in my household, the refrigerator gets a real workout. Jeremiah 29, 11, here's what it says. For I know the plans and the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord. I know what I'm thinking. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a what? Hope. What is hope? The absolute certainty that God is moving. So with that, chapter 14, verse 1. Remember, still hanging crisply in the air. One of you will betray me. Peter, you're going to deny me. And I'm going somewhere that you can't follow. What? Verse 1, chapter 14. Let not your heart be, really. I know that your heart is troubled, guys, from what I just said. Remember, they're still thinking, we're going to still be in the millennial reign here pretty soon. I'm going to get the biggest office. No, I'm going to get the biggest office. I'm going to get the biggest office. That's about when Jesus strips to his gym shorts and starts washing their stinky feet. I know that your heart is troubled. You believe in God, will believe also in me. Verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And where I'm going is, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Another strong tool against disappointment. Um, please remember, Harvest, our real home is not here. I, do you have mansions circled in your Bible? I do. Um, is it real mansions like, I don't know, 19 bedrooms and 55 bathrooms? I don't know. It's going to be glorious. 
Uh, remember Keith Green, the artist and the singer of the 80s? His great song, He Made the Heavens and the Earth in Six Days. He's been working on heaven for 2,000 years. It's going to be pretty special. Please remember, Harvest, that's your home. Not this one. Not here. It's heaven with, an, with a holy, eternal God. Oh, and when we're there, you know what else you are destined for if you are a believer in Jesus Christ? You get to spend family time forever with other resurrected, completely changed, and renewed believers. That's what we were made for. All right, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. And by the way, what really makes heaven heaven is Jesus. Harvest is Jesus. I hope we all sense it when we're worshiping the Lord on Wednesdays and here on Sunday mornings. I hope you sense a little slice of heaven when the verses you're singing, suddenly it dawns on you that that's the desperate cry of your heart. I do want to be with you. I just want you, Lord. I just want you. Just want you. And when you have that sense and then you look up and you've been worshiping now for 30 minutes, where'd the time go? I think that's a little slice of what it's going to be like. What really makes heaven is not the environment, although that'll be spectacular. What makes heaven is Jesus. Verse 4. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now Thomas, he's called the doubter, but really he's a skeptic. God does not mind honest skeptics. Everybody else is all, yeah, Jesus. Uh, uh, huh? Thomas thrusts his arms up. What, Lord, said Thomas? Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Good job, Thomas. Verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth. And the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And uh, how many times have you heard your friends say, you know, look, you know, say your non-believing friends, I don't mind you believing in Jesus, but don't tell me that my belief system is wrong. Well, crucial point here. I didn't say your system was wrong. Jesus said the only way, truth and life, is through him. I didn't say that he did. By the way, he, Jesus, healed the sick. He ordered demons around. He walked on water. Oh, and then he did that little raise himself from the dead thing. I say it often, but it is so true. Every other religion on the planet, when it's human base, have you ever noticed the humans have to Climb some rigorous ladder to get to the holiness of God. Biblical Christianity is the only system where God says, I'm going to zip up a human suit and come down to Steve's awful, sin-saturated level because he's stuck and he can't get out. Buddha never claimed to be the God who created the heavens and the earth. Neither did Joseph Smith Jr. or Baha'u'llah or Muhammad. They just said, oh, we're just prophets, you know. Jesus actually did say on several occasions, I am the creator of the heavens and the earth. Oops, whole different ball game. You better be proving that you are who you say you are. And how did he do that? Well, he walked on water. <laughs> he cast out demons. He healed the sick. Oh, yeah, he was killed brutally and violently within the public view right out on that hill of Calvary. And then three days later, he was walking around. Biblical Christianity is the only one based on a historical, provable, archaeologically substantiated fact. Jesus was dead, and now he's not dead. And hundreds of eyewitnesses saw it. Jesus healed the sick, he ordered demons around, he walked on water, and then he rose from the dead. What does your belief system stand on? Verse 7. 
If you had known me, now it seems a bit like of a, a slight here, just a little bit, but what he's really sort of saying is, now I know you guys have a certain intellectual grasp that I am Messiah. You've said so, so good. But I know that you don't really have it really what that means. You don't really, really know, but you will. I am the God who created everything. I am the God of Genesis 1 verse 1. And I will eventually separate all fallen men and angels. And, and I will construct a new heaven and a new earth flowing with light and love and purpose and belonging. But before any of that can happen, I have to die on Passover. And because you guys are looking at this next few days, weeks, years, in your own mind, you have fashioned a certain reality. And when you see me dying on that cross by tomorrow, you're going to get rattled. You're going to get shaken. Verse 7. If you had known me, all the above, then you would have known my father also, meaning his perfect plan. And from now on, you know him and you have seen him. Remember Palm Sunday, he was rejected. Um, 30 pieces of silver is just happening over there. There's Judas getting paid. Um, the kangaroo court that we're going to read about the next couple weeks, the beatings, the whipping, the cross, my violent death on a tree. Did the father know about all of that? Sure did. And in fact, he wrote it down in the scriptures. Did you know that the book of Zechariah says that Messiah is going to be rejected and is going to be turned over and is going to be betrayed for how many pieces of silver? 30. Do you know that's in your Old Testament? A little more digging. Do you know what 30 pieces of silver bought in those days? A wounded servant. Check it out. It's in the scriptures. That's all part of the Father's plan, you guys. That's why he wrote it down. But because of your expectations, Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, you think the millennial, the millennial reign is going to start here any second. That's all going to be proved incorrect, and you're about to be big time crushed and big time disappointment with me and with God. And like many today, you might even be tempted to shake your fists at the heavens and demand, what are you doing, God? Have you heard that? In a time of sort of focused prayer for the Lord, you kind of get quiet. You're trying to get quiet. And you're bugged and you're disappointed. And there's some strong challenge just yelling at you like a Goliath. You'll never defeat me. Never. And you go to the Lord and you hit your knees and you begin to pray. And here comes that old voice. What are you praying for? Where was God during your time of trial? And those years ago, when the people that should have been your support system and protection hurt you, betrayed you so badly, where was God then? It happens. And in spite of all the miracles Jesus is saying to these 11, because remember, Judas is gone. In spite of all the miracles that you've seen me do, boys, in spite of all the demons you've seen me toss out, you've seen me walk on water, remember that? And raise the dead, yet you have a small-ish perspective, and your perspective isn't correct. It is self-centered, and you're going to be disappointed when you see me dying. You're going to go, what is happening? And that is going to become a powerful, overwhelming urge to quit. Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, everyone here within the sound of my voice is here as an appointed time. And I personally believe the enemy has had a tremendous effect in the hearts and minds of many. And disappointment has sucked all the life out of their heart and marriage. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, help them to see 
there is a higher plan at work. And these guys are going to be hugely disappointed with God and with Jesus by this time tomorrow. And like disappointment always does, it wants you to give up and quit. And so then what's the use? I pray in Jesus' name, Lord God, you would minister to every single heart that that has been the inner dialogue as of late. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would be the lifter of everyone's head. And Lord God, that like, almost as if they were there that night on the Last Supper, the upper room, and perhaps Jesus is speaking to them sitting on the other side of Peter. I know your heart is troubled and you are hugely disappointed with me and my word. Jesus is saying, stay with it. You will see a resurrection soon. I pray that for everyone here. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Verse, you know what? Hold your finger here. I'm gonna show you something. Show you somebody else. Second Samuel, please. Old Testament book of Second Samuel. Second Samuel chapter six. Second Samuel chapter six. I wanna show you a huge disappointment in the Bible. I praise God that the Bible uh, depicts real men and women of God in real circumstances and settings. <laughs> Doesn't sugarcoat it. Are you quickly, are you in 2 Samuel chapter 6? Look at verse 1. Uh, king David is now the king of all of Israel. Um, he is flying high. And the Ark of the Covenant and Moses' tabernacle has not been there in Jerusalem. And David says, I'm going to bring it to Jerusalem. Good idea, David. I think uh, your heart to do so is a good one. Now watch this. Chapter 6, 2 Samuel, verse 1. Again, David, gathering all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. What we have here is a big parade. Verse 2. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to and to bring up from there the Ark of the Covenant. We're going to bring it home, boys. We're going to bring the Ark to Jerusalem. Woo! <laughs> That's where it belongs. Is that a good thing on David's heart? It is. Um, where the Ark of the Co where there the Ark of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of Hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. Verse three. So they set the ark of God on a new cart. Interesting. Um, you who are already ahead of this story, is that how you're supposed to transport the ark of God? No, the Bible says very plainly, I don't need limousines. I don't need a great big new cart because that's what you do if you're human. We're going to build a huge and a beautiful cart. As John Carson says, with a board and big wheels, important people, and really flashy stuff. That's how you impress. And that's how God wants to be seen. David's heart is right, but he's not biblical. Watch this, verse 3. And so they set the ark of God on a new cart, and he brought it out of the house of Abinadab, uh, which was on the hill, and then Yuza and Ahio. Yuza's name means strong. And Ahio's name means friendly. Whew. If you're going to have somebody drive the cart, you know, in the front of the parade, let's get somebody really handsome and strong and someone who's very friendly. I can see him sort of on the, on the float. Whoa, you know, doing that wave. The sons of Abinadab drove the new cart, and they brought, verse 4, it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on, which was on the hill, accompanying the, the ark of God. And Ohio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, fir wood, on harps and string instruments. 
and tambourines and cisterns and cymbals. What we have here is a worship time, a beautiful worship time, and thousands and thousands of people. What a glorious time. Oh, look at God move literally on the back of that cart. Verse 6. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the ark had stumbled. Read that bump in the road. So it was jostling, and he put his hand on it. Those of you, again, ahead of the story, are any humans supposed to touch the ark? No, because it's a model of God's holiness. Verse 7. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he, what? I'm sorry, he, what? He died. In the middle of this awesome worship service? Yeah. He's dead now. I think the man, do, 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 what? Now we have a dead guy laying next to the ark of the God, ark of God. There by the ark of God, verse 8. And David became, say it with me, angry. Who's he mad at? He's mad at God, you guys. Because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And then David was next, what? afraid of the Lord. You could read that. He's mad at God and he's like, I don't trust you, Lord. Have you ever been there? This was your party, God. Your, we're doing it all for you. Time out. This is also very close and akin to David's inauguration. He's the new king of Israel. Yes, he has a heart to to say that we love the Lord and that the ark of God should be in Jerusalem. He's correct. But is there also and potentially an ulterior motive? Did David want the return of the ark and all of that grandeur and all that party and soaring nationalism? Was any part of that David saying, that'll just make me a stronger king in the eyes of many? Don't know, can't say. But for sure, what David wanted to do was his thing. And he's convinced it's such a good thing until something has died. And now he is angry. Verse 9, and he who did not trust God, he was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord, the glory of God, the presence of God come to me? Have you ever said that? Let me rephrase. You and I have all said this same thing. I thought God was going to do this and such over here, and he didn't do anything like that. I am angry, and I don't trust him, and I don't trust his Bible. How is it ever possible that the real God and his life could ever be a part of mine? I want you to see that it has happened on a number of occasions. Now, you read the rest of the story, and then he frumps for a long time, and then he goes back to the Bible. And the priests say, well, David, here was your error. No carts. You're supposed to put these poles through the rings in the corners, and it was to be borne or carried on the shoulders of the priests. Trained, consecrated priests. And then that's how they do bring the ark of God in, and it is joyous. But there, before we leave 2 Samuel chapter 6, do you see it in verse 8? David was mad at God. Back to chapter 14, please. Gospel of John chapter 14. David learned a painful and a powerful message. Lesson that day. Doing God's word his way. Then David was able to bring, as it were, the presence of God to Jerusalem. Verse 8, chapter 14, Gospel of John. So Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be sufficient. And so Jesus all, <laughs> verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, you guys, and yet you have not known me, Philip? 
Remember, they have said, you're Messiah. They said so in Matthew chapter 16. Who are people saying that I am? Well, maybe this guy, this guy, this guy. Who do you say that I am? You're Messiah. Well done, Peter. Flesh and blood doesn't reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven. So they'd said the words, Messiah, but they didn't really know what it means. Jesus said to them, verse 9, have I been with you so long, guys, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Is Jesus God, you guys? Yes, he is. Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else, believe me for the sake of the works themselves. You've seen what I've done. I wrote in my margin, when ravaged by disappointment and wanting to quit, the devil is always right there with, where's your God now? Remember, Jesus is God. He is God. Praise him. Thank him for all the things and times he did move. That's also a great uh, weapon against disappointment and even depression. Thank him. Praise him. Thank him for what he has done. Verse 12. Most assuredly I say to you that he who believes in me and the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. What he's talking about here is the Holy Spirit. You can write that in. We won't have time to get to it today, but starting next week, he's going to say the best hedge and protection against disappointment is the filling of the Holy Spirit. Because what happens? You get love, joy. What was that third one? Peace, long-suffering, and you're kind. And what was that last one again? Self-control. By the way, that fruit of the Spirit, whose responsibility is it that Steve has the fruit of the Spirit? What's my wife? Everybody knows that. If she behaves herself, then it's easy. Then I can be fruit of the Spirit. Is that accurate? No. What circumstance do I get to blame that I don't have to be fruit of the Spirit. Can you think of a circumstance? I'm thinking of the Apostle Paul uh, who got thrown into prison there in the book of Acts, there in Philippi. He got the stew beat out of him. And he got chunked into the lowest prison. In those days, they didn't have indoor plumbing, so they tried their best to sort of slope the floor toward a hole. And then all the re all the stuff, let's don't go into what the stuff might be, would drain to the next floor. There'd be a hole there too. Well, in the bottom, there was no hole. That's the inner prison. That's where Paul was. His wounds stinging, his lips swollen, his face puffed up because of the blows, perhaps. He's shackled wrist to ankles. Surely at that point, he could say, I came here, Lord, because you told me. Remember the guy from Macedonia? Come over here. That's what he was doing. And that's one of their first stops was Philippi. And he gets that kind of treatment. Is that the occasion where Paul gets the excuse to not have to have the fruit of the Spirit? But he did. And remember the story? They sang praises, not complaining. They sang praises. And don't forget what happened. An earthquake rattled the place. Boing! All of the doors sprung open. And one last detail. What happened to all the, the chains and the shackles? They fell off. And all the freed people all met outside of the prison. How did this happen? And that opened the door for Paul to speak the gospel. Harvest, when we're disappointed with God, when we're pretty sure he let me down, are you open to the fact that like David, your intention may have been correct, even godly, but were you being biblical? Did you miss something? 
And what if God is allowing a pinch of circumstances and you didn't do a thing? What if it's God saying, I need you, I need other people to see you going through the squeeze and you don't complain and you don't tear down and you don't blame them, it, her, him for your lack of fruit. You just simply are. That's where the church of Philippi, the book of Philippians, comes from. It comes from those prisoners who listened about midnight to Paul and Silas. What were they doing? Singing the praises of God. Then all the miracles happened. True story, true story. Verse number 12. Most assuredly, I say to you that he who believes in me and the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Holy because I go to my Father. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. After the second chapter of the book of Acts, a bunch of people filled with the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit, supernatural gifts of the Spirit written on their hearts. There's not going to be a sort of one guy doing that, Jesus, in one location. There's going to be you 11, and then 120, and then 240, and then 480, and pretty soon on and on, more and more, and finally all over the planet. And prayerfully here, it's 350 South Rock Boulevard. That's what he means. And then I wrote my margin at, and then I wrote my address in, and then my work, my school. Is that what's happening? Am I, exam am I exemplifying and modeling the fruit of the Spirit? Verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, really what that means is according to my character. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son, verse 14. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now in polite church company, we all go, yep, I know that verse is in there. But it's not been my experience. You don't have to raise your hand. What is he saying here? I prayed plenty of stuff in Jesus' name. That's not what this means. When I pray in Jesus' name, it means am I praying according to his character and revealed will. Filled with God's spirit, obedient to his word, walking in fruit. That means I am also not my will, Lord, but yours be done. That's where my head is at. Then my prayers and my heart are biblically correct. Lord, I pray, and then you get to fill in the blank, in Jesus' name. That is not a kind of a heavenly credit card. Lord, men, I could sure use a better job, a bigger car, a better neighborhood. Or a, if only I had this, if only I had that. That may not be God's will for you. But the more Bible you have in your heart and mind and the more filled with the Spirit you are and the more not my will, Lord, but yours be done, pretty soon you are praying his character. And then God answers those. We're going to end with this, Chris. Go ahead. Let's go up with our first one. Filled with God's Spirit and obedient to his word, walking in truth and faith. You're going to pray biblically. But... Did you know that there are six, well, probably more, but I've identified six hindrances to prayer. Jesus said, if I prayed in Jesus' name, then I'm, then I'm going to have it. Why don't I have that? Would you ask yourself these questions? Number one, hindrances to prayer could be, go ahead, are you in God's word a lot? If you're only... Bible that you sort of get into your computer database comes from Sunday morning only, I don't know that that's going to be the best for you. WWPF means word every day, worship every day, prayer every day, if not all the time, and fellowship. 
And if I'm not in God's word, we'll see in John chapter 15, Jesus says, if, I, if you abide, that doesn't mean drop by. <laughs> that means come in and sit down for a while. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, that word abide is a nautical term. It's when your little boat comes up against a bigger ship and a ladder is thrown over the side and the captain says, come aboard. That's the word abide. Come aboard. Hang with us. Then you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. I think the converse of this principle is equally as powerful. If you're not in the word, it's just too easy to pray non-biblical stuff. Number two, go ahead. If I'm regarding sin in my life, this is Psalm 66 verse 18. If I regard, and what does regard mean? It means I look on intently. Do you remember the story that Lot is being saved out of awful Sodom and Gomorrah? Do you remember that? And the Bible says that um, when the angel supernaturally is going to rescue them out and not as they're on their way out, Lot's wife, Mrs. Lot, turns back and looks at Sodom and Gomorrah and suddenly she's a pillar of salt, Morton salt, non-iodized salt. Did she glance? Is that a crime? That word for look in the Old Testament is the same thing here, regard. You look on intently and longingly. Remember, she's running from the city that is on fire because of supernatural and divine judgment. And she's looking back going, oh, I wish I were there. Do I look at my sin like that? I'm only not doing it because God said not to, so I'm not going to do it. But boy, do I love it. If I regard sin in my life, I look on intently and I'm longing for, the Lord will not hear me. Uh, three, go ahead. What if I'm living in rebellion? I go to church, but then on Monday and Tuesday, if you saw me, um, you would know that I'm living as if God never gave me an instruction against it. Living in rebellion, that's 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, says Samuel to King Saul. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you, Saul, from being king. When I'm carting around rebellion in my heart. Word of God says ABC, but I see it different. Pastor says ABC, but he doesn't know. Young people, the parents that God has given you, God's, God's covering is God's protection. If that is in my heart that I know better, God can't say anything to you. So he is doing you a big favor by not giving you the answers to those prayers you have been praying. Number four, go ahead, not respecting spouses. This is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands likewise dwell with them, your wives, with understanding giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. That doesn't mean deficient vessel. It means you are physically stronger than her. Do not ever use your strength to bow up on your wife. Don't you ever use your strength of your, your physique or your voice to try to intimidate her. I'm watching you. As to the weaker vessel... And as being heirs together of the grace of God, that your prayers may not be hindered. It's been said, it's easy to be a Christian at church. The hard place to be a Christian or the most challenging and the most powerful. What are you at home? How is your life? How would your wife or your husband describe your walk with Jesus? If it's not working at home, Harvest, it's not working, no matter what we put on here at church. How are we treating our spouse? Do we listen? Is there something in us that wants to cover, protect them? Number five, unresolved offenses. This is Matthew 5, verse 23. 
Jesus said, therefore, if you bring your offering to the altar and the church, woohoo! And there you remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar. Go your way, go fix it. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. How many times are people in church singing all the songs? Tears streaming down their cheeks. They feel very close to the Lord. But they have something that God has been trying to get them to fix. They are being awful on social media. I don't know. To the president? To some political candidate? They are being awful and shredding people at work at the water cooler. God says, I hate that. I was slaughtered for that. And then number six, are you living, am I living in two worlds, double-mindedness? This is James 1, verses 6 through 8. I'll read the NIV version. A person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea, tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from God. Why? Why? Because their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And they are unstable in everything that they do. And it is God's grace that he's not answering them. Amen? We're all done. Let's all stand. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for the songs you led us to sing this morning. I just want you. Now, that may not be sort of the heart's cry of everyone in this room. If not, I pray that someday it would be. As we saw illustrated by King David, who had the means and the resources to throw quite a party, quite a wonderful time. But there was something at the core of it that was not right and it was not biblical. David was not acting biblical. And somebody died. Lord, I pray if there is a death of sorts, if there is something that is lean and not vigorous and full of life, is it because, Lord, that I am carting around some willful disobedience, Lord, that your spirit has been nudging me to recognize and to repent of? Everybody's head down and eyes closed for a moment. Lord Jesus, we know that your Bible says that your plans for me are not to harm me, but to give me a future and a hope. And that as the heavens are above the earth, so are your ways above mine. If I've got my mitts all over the steering wheel and I'm wondering why there's damage, Lord, maybe it's because I haven't given the wheel totally to you. This morning I pray, Lord God, move through this place. Is the Spirit sort of nudging you? You are holding on to this. Lord, show them what the this might be. You're holding on to it too tight. The enemy has recognized your grip on that thing. And so he just pokes it whenever he wants. And that's why you don't have love joy and peace and that's why discouragement and disappointment has sucked the life out of your marriage out of your ministry can you pray this this morning Lord Jesus what is it if I'm not love joy peace that's nobody's fault Show me what it is, Lord, and let me bring it to the altar and that you burn it to ashes, Lord, and that, Lord, you fill my heart today and my family and my marriage. Fill it, Lord, and fill me and fill us with your Holy Spirit. I give you all of my life today, all of it, including them, including that is yours, Lord. Take it. In Jesus' name. And now everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.